Thank you all for joining us again. Uh, my name is Matt Williams and I work out of the Charleston office for the South Carolina chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat, which you should see at the bottom of the screen. And we will keep everyone on mute for the presentation. And later during the Q&A, we'll go through the chat and make sure we, we address the questions and, um, and our experts will, will answer those best they can. So a few housekeeping notes. Um, all, of our, all of you are on mute, except the presenters. Um, again, if you do have a question, type it into the chat at the bottom of the screen. And for optimal viewing experience, if you wanna go up into the top right corner of your Zoom screen, you'll see a tab that says view. Click on that and you can put it on the uh, speaker view which allows you to see just the, the screen of the person that's speaking. So um, many of you know the Nature Conservancy probably very well and have been supporting us for, for quite some time, uh, which we thank you for. And uh, you get our quarterly publications from South Carolina. But for those of you that are new to the organization, um, we are working in over 72 countries. Um, we have now protected over 125 million acres around the globe. Um, here in South Carolina, we've been working since 1969 when our very first project in partnership with Audubon established the Francis Bidler Forest. Um, since then, we've protected and helped protect over 400,000 acres all over the, the state of South Carolina, um, from the Southern Blue Ridge down to the, to the coast. Um, we also have programs in fresh water uh, protection for drinking water, restoring native forest, which we're going to talk about a lot today on, on the presentation, uh, coastal resilience, helping communities uh, address flooding issues with nature-based solutions, and also with fisheries management for the South Atlantic. Um, I grew up um, on the coast of South Carolina in Georgetown. And I had the good fortune of growing up on a place called Kenlaw on the Santee Delta. So I'm, I'm very much tied to the low country, the pine forest. My dad did control burning at Kenlaw. And, um, but I didn't get to visit Sandy Island until I started working for the Nature Conservancy. And if you look in the background of my screen, you'll see an image of a field trip that we conducted on the island a couple of years ago. And I think this was an early December and I'm gonna change it to my normal room screen in just a second because I think it's a little distracting, but I wanted you to see what Sandy Island looks like in December, which in the Northern part of the island, very, very orange, very, very red. So today we're joined by Tom Dooley, our Director of Forest Conservation for the South Carolina chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Tom's gonna to take us through the majority of the presentation. Um, talk about Sandy Island, one of my favorite places in the world. And then we also have another colleague, Colette DeGarity, who is the Longleaf Pine Whole System Director for the Nature Conservancy. So that means Colette's working in an effort to restore Longleaf Pine from Virginia all the way to Texas. And which is, I think, is a cool reminder that the Nature Conservancy is working all over the country and we're always thinking big. So whenever you give to the Nature Conservancy in South Carolina, you're not only supporting the work we're doing in great places like Sandy Island, but you're part of a multi-state effort to restore longleaf pine and native forests throughout the Southeast. And, and, and rest assured, the Nature Conservancy is always thinking big. So uh, thank you, Colette. We'll hear from her in a, in a few minutes. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Dooley. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for, uh, for attending. And i um, uh, excited to talk about Sandy Island. It's, it is one of my favorite places in the world as well. Um, and I, I think it's probably one of the most isolated areas on the East Coast. Um, it is, uh, a, in fact, uh, the largest undeveloped freshwater island on the East Coast, um, despite being close to Myrtle Beach, and you're about, when you're on Sandy Island, you're about oh, 12, 14 air miles from the Myrtle Beach Airport. So you're pretty close to a pretty urban, uh, well-developed area. 
um, but it feels like you've been stepping back in time. And I know I feel isolated um, when I go out there um, and I love it. I love going out there. And um, I think anybody else who's ever been to Sandy Island has a, a deep appreciation for the place. So it's like stepping, it's, it's really like stepping back in time. <clears throat> and um, I think we'll just kick it off talking a little bit about history um, of Sandy Island um, and, uh, and the preserve itself. And um, <clears throat> you can, uh, here's a, just a, a representation of, of Sandy Island um, here. Um, as it falls, it sits right in the, this kind of corner um, border between Georgetown and Horry County, um, right on the coast. Um, and Sandy Island was formed um, like thousands and thousands of years ago um, as a result of two rivers dumping into what was at the time the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean was, was uh, further inland than it sits right now. And these two rivers uh, created uh, uh, almost a delta-like situation there. And they dumped a lot of sand um, and sediment. And as the ocean receded, um, what you're left with is uh, effectively dunes, um, and that makes up the core piece of, of Sandy Island. Um, fast forward um, several thousands of years, if not many thousands of years, um, and Native Americans settled in this area as well uh, because of uh, all the fresh water that was around as well as access to the coast. Um, you had... Uh, uh, PD Native Americans, Winyan Native Americans, Waccamaw, um, all settled in this area. Uh, they didn't necessarily live on Sandy Island. There's no evidence that they actually lived on Sandy Island, but they did frequent Sandy Island, um, just based on where they were, their villages were located in, in proximity to the island. Um, fast forward to more, um, uh, recent past and um, uh, what happens when European settlers come to, um, uh, to America, they push out the Native Americans, um, they establish themselves, um, they, white Europeans bring with them or um, uh, uh, bring with them enslaved Africans um, and they developed uh, a rice culture around Sandy Island, in particular around Georgetown as well as Sandy Island. And um, these enslaved Africans that were captives and uh, brought, with, brought over um, against their will, they brought with them uh, the, rice, um, the rice seeds from Africa, but they also brought with them the ingenuity and the engineering to cultivate that rice. Um, and with emancipation, uh, uh, after the Civil War, um, the rice industry slowly, slowly disappeared. Um, and that's a direct result to, there was no more free labor for these white landowners to, um, uh, to use to enrich themselves. So um, there's still a lot of cultural resources around Sandy Island, and, and there's a couple of pictured here. Um, this is, uh, excuse me, this is a, a, an old rice field. <clears throat> it's a, a little difficult to see, but it's an old rice field um, that uh, was once cultivated for rice, obviously. Um, we have several broken and impounded rice fields around the island still today. Um, the, uh, the broken ones are slowly converting to um, uh, bottomland hardwood forest, and the impounded ones that are still impounded um, serve as good waterfowl habitat and wading bird habitat. Um, superimpose over this the, the rice cultivation um, as well as into the, the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, naval stores in, in the turpentine industry became very important as well, and that began around the 1700s. Um, and uh, the, the primary method that we see evidence of on Sandy Island um, is, is for turpentine production. And um, that began around the early 1800s. Um, 
And this is, these are other cultural resources that we see on Sandy Island. These turpentine trees are also known as, as cat face trees. Um, and uh, they, the people would go out and, and scar the sides of these trees and uh, create little, little dugout bowls in the bottom of them that were called the box. And uh, sap would run out of that tree and collect in the, in the box. And they would, every two or three days, they'd go around, collect the sap, put it in a barrel, and take it down river to, to be processed. Um, and they did that for a number of reasons. Uh, naval stores uh, were an important industry at the time, um, as well as just any, anything resin, pine sap related. So, um, um, Georgetown was, a, was a, a major processing center, right, for George, the turpentine industry. Yeah, Georgetown at one time had uh, somewhere in the number of, I believe, 11 turpentine um, distilleries, uh, which it's just pretty amazing to think about Georgetown having that level of an industry um, concentrated there. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was a, a, main, uh, a main hub for, for manufacturing and, and uh, distributing turpentine products. Um, timber also played a, a role on Sandy Island, albeit uh, less, less of an extent on the upland piece, more to the, on the bottomlands. Sandy Island for the extraction of, of um, cypress trees. Um, they did, however, cut longleaf pine out of, out of the woods as well. Um, and I think we have a poll question here for, for the audience. Um, yeah, what other, other products uh, are derived from pine sap? Um, and uh, make your selections and, and we'll see, uh, we'll see how, what you all think. All right. Oh, well, we've got a lot of folks, huh? Yeah. So. All right. It looks like uh, people, most people said 98% uh, said varnish. Um, actually, all of those are correct, um, believe it or not. Um, all of those can be derived or are derived from, uh, from pine sap. Um, so. Uh, thanks for participating in our little pop-up poll there. Good stuff. Um, so just this is a, an aerial representation of Sandy Island. Um, and I just want to point out some of the features of the island itself. Just to orient you, um, for those of you who know, this is uh, the area. This is Brookgreen Gardens. Um, so this is Highway 17 down here on the the bottom right hand corner. So Brook Green Gardens is right here. Um, and uh, so just south, a little south of Myrtle Beach. Um, the island itself uh, sits between the Waccamaw Rivers, which the Waccamaw bounds it to the east. Um, the Great PD River bounds it to the west. Um, Thoroughfare Creek bounds it to the south and Bull Creek and Little Bull Creek bound it to the north. Um, it's about 12,000 acres, as I said. Um, in 1993, um, the current landowners at the time wished to build a bridge to the island. There was, there is no bridge to the island there, um, uh, and there never has been as far as we know. So, but uh, these, these landowners wanted to build a bridge um, with the, uh, the idea of that they wanted to harvest timber off of the island. Um, and it was thought that they would like, it would likely lead to further development, which was coming. Um, if, when, you, when you're that close to Myrtle Beach, you can, you can kind of see the writing on the wall. Um, conservation groups and, and environmental groups, uh, along with residents of the island, um, really fought that uh, the development of the bridge and, and the, the timber harvesting that was proposed and, and the likely coming development. Um, and uh, ultimately in 1996, um, Sandy Island uh, was protected um, and uh, the Department of Transportation, South Carolina Department of Transportation contributed $10 million to the effort to create a, a mitigation bank um, so that they could use mitigation credits to do um, road construction in the area. Um, the landowners, the current landowners agreed to forego a million dollars of the, um, the value of the property and the Nature Conservancy raised a um, million dollars 
um, through support of, of donors like you. And, and that's just a, a tremendous conservation success story. It really is all the way around. Um, so the, the area of, of Sandy Island itself is protected is about 9,000 acres. Um, and uh, we, the Nature Conservancy, uh, we manage it um, in partnership, in close partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's, much of our management um, couldn't happen if not for the uh, contributions of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, a couple of other features that I'd like to point out are these extensive bottomland areas to the west as well as to the east. Um, you can see um, these old rice fields down here um, along the southeastern side of the island as well as just south and west of the island. Um, these are all kind of succeeding back into bottomland hardwood or they are likely to be impounded and, and managed as impoundments as well. Um, I'll leave a message. Sometimes I'm tied up. And um, uh, so the, you have these historic rice fields in this area. Um, and then this swath uh, that you see up the island here in the center of the island is um, really xeric longleaf pine forest. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with xeric, it just means dry, but it's a really good Scrabble word if you're into playing Scrabble. X-E-R-I-C, xeric. Um, so write that down. Um, but that, that, that dryness of, of Sandy Island really makes it a hard place to grow for plants. Um, but it's really perfect for lonely pine forests. Um, and Tom, Tom yeah. if you don't mind, you, you point out with your, your pointer there, the uh, Wakawachi Marina. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. This is Wakawachi Marina right here. Yeah. So for those of you that we're going to talk about visiting the island um, a little bit later in the presentation, but there is a, a creek just north up the river from Wakawachi called Fox Creek or Vaux Creek, depending on your, your pronunciation. But we've taken some trips into Sandy Island throughout the year. Uh, but when you do go in there in the spring, uh, one of the things that you'll notice other than the, the color of the, of the swamp system or the, the bottomland hardwood, um, is the sound of birds, and that's the sound of, of migratory birds that are nesting in these, these bottomland hardwoods. So they travel up from, um, from South America, and, um, and you'll just hear a, a whole symphony of, of sound as you pass through these forests. So they're very important for, for nesting and for, and for carbon sequestration as, to, as well. That's right. Um, I'll just call it, you. I mentioned earlier the, the idea of of sand dunes and um, you can see these real white or, or light patches that kind of run east to west here across the island, up and down the island. Um, and those are, those are the tops of ridges um, or hills um, on the island. And um, you have this kind of ridge and swell topography um, scattered across the entire island, mm. um, which, which um, is very unique to the coastal plain, particularly the, the um, that close to to the ocean. Yeah, the highest point in Georgetown County is on Sandy Island, which is seventy two feet, or uh, somewhere around there, uh, sixty or seventy feet, something like that. But yeah, the highest point in Georgetown County is is on Sandy Island, which is kind of fun to think about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and those, you know, like I said, it's perfect for longleaf pine to grow, but it's still tough for for those those trees to grow. Um, in the swells and the depressions where you're closer to the water table, um, you know, we have 100-year-old trees that are about 17 inches in diameter, um, that are long, long leaf trees that are 17 inches in diameter. And then if you just go up the hill um, to the top of the hill, you get, we have 100-year-old trees that are about 11 inches in diameter. And so um, just pretty amazing to think about how much the location of a plant or where a plant is located uh, determines how it grows. So, um, yeah, we'll move along here. Um, I want to point out that um, uh, we talked a lot about, uh, just a little bit about longleaf um, so far. And the longleaf pine forest, um, it doesn't matter where it is, but um, fire is a requ requisite ecological function for longleaf forests to perpetuate. Um, if if you have a longleaf forest and you don't have fire, you're not gonna have a longleaf forest for, for very long. It's not gonna sustain itself. 
Um, so fires are a requirement. Um, and the, the covenants and restrictions that were um, put in place at the time of Sandy Island's protection really restrict the forest management activities that, that we can employ on the island. Um, uh, so that limits us quite a bit to only fire, um, which again makes this another unique place in which to manage longleaf pine forests. Um, most other places that are managing longleaf pine forests can cut trees and plant trees and um, apply herbicide um, if needed, et cetera. Um, but here we're, we're getting back to the roots and, and the uh, historical and nature, a natural aspect of managing a forest with, with a natural process. So, and again, I just wanna underscore like Fish and Wildlife Service, we wouldn't be able to burn out here if not for Fish and Wildlife Service. They supply trucks and, and um, uh, ATV, UTV for us to, to be able to move around the island and uh, apply fire to the island. Tom, I think it's worth mentioning just because of, to give some perspective that uh, fire is a natural yes. occurring element, right? It, it, was, it was more prevalent before, wildfires were more prevalent before European settlers came to, the, to North America. So it is a natural part of our, our ecosystem. Yes, there's one, not one terrestrial system that hasn't been influenced by fire at some point in time. Um, and by some, it could be 500 year intervals or it could be three year intervals, but yes, fires played a role, considerable role. Um, just to stay on the fire topic for, for a moment here, um, our prescribed fire efforts on Sandy Island. So, um, when we first started managing the island, there was a lack of, uh, of fire for an indeterminate amount of time, but we, we know it was present. We have evidence. Um, you see um, lightning strike evidence on the island, um, around the island. Um, the, um, uh, the forest, so the forest itself is evidence. Longleaf pine doesn't exist for long periods of time without fire. Um, as are the resident wildlife that are on the island. And so when we first began, we were reintroducing fire in these long unburned forests. Um, and it poses some real challenges. So you get this uh, buildup of fuel on the ground. And from this picture of the dog, if the dog's um, sitting in ash and, um, and you can see the amount of fuel that's, that's burned um, uh, behind the dog in the background. Um, and it's got to be about a foot, um, 18 inches to a foot of, of leaf litter and, um, and duff that is sitting on top of the soil. Um, and this is what happens when you, you know, when you put fire into long unburned stands and you don't burn it necessarily under the right conditions. Um, so, and this, this result can really decimate a whole swath of mature longleaf forests. Um, so just just to give you a, a wrap up a little bit about our fire, fire work here and our management work on the island, um, our focus in using fire is, is threefold. Uh, we wanna have a healthy forest with diverse ages of longleaf. Um, we don't wanna have a single age of longleaf on the island. Uh, we wanna diversify that as much as possible. Um, we wanna reduce the threat of wildfire. And finally, we wanna promote habitat for a variety of species. Um, and just on that note, I'll uh, give you a little anecdote. Um, in 2009, we really ramped up the, uh, um, the scale at which we were putting fire um, on the ground on Sandy Island. And uh, we burned an area that's about a little over 600 acres. And uh, these pecosins, these shrubby, areas that are typically wet or can be kind of seasonally wet. Um, they like to encroach on the, on the uplands. So they'll move out of those wetter areas and move into the higher ground. Um, we put fire into uh, this 600 acre area and we burned through the Pocosin. Um, and uh, this was previously unburned area, no known fire history. And what happened was that fire top killed the brush. You can see the standing shrubs, the standing dead shrubs that are left as a result of the fire. But what happened was when we took that shrub layer off, we exposed the ground to sun that it hadn't seen in who knows how long. Um, 
and up sprang the, this large, it was, like, it was a, like a forest of pitcher plants in, in place of, of those shrubs. And that all occurred in a matter of weeks um, after the fire. It was really impressive. And it gives you a really good sense of that you're doing something right for the world um, when you have results like this. So um, this I think that brings me. us to our next. Go ahead, Matt. I was going to mention, this reminds me of a field trip we took on Sandy Island, and we saw a spot where we had, uh, it might have been this, this spot, uh, but we've, we've, we saw the pitcher plants were dormant in the drier part of the, the year, and they were a brown, kind of brittle, brittle. they were brown in color yeah. and then brittle in feeling, and um, I think it was Eric Krieger, one of our scientists, opened one up and peeled it back and showed everybody the what, what the plants live on, which are bugs, which is, which is interesting. Um, yeah. It's always fun to cut one problems. open and see, see what it's been eaten on. And you can, you can do some good bug identification with some of the, some of the carcasses that are still in there. It's, it's really interesting stuff. Um, so let's, uh, let's pull that whole question up. Uh, what are the products or, or no, that's a, let's see, which species found on Sandy Island are endangered? Um, and I would, I would say um, federally endangered, which, which species on Sandy Island are federally endangered. All right. Oh, we got some smart cookies out there. Um, that's right. Uh, red cockaded woodpeckers um, are the uh, the federally endangered species that that reside on Sandy Island. Um, longleaf uh, is is certainly rare, um, in, in terms of where, what it used to be um, prior to uh, lots of coastal development. Pitcher plants um, are are rare as well. Um, as are swallowtail kites, but only red cockaded woodpeckers enjoy the, the designation of, of federally endangered. <clears throat> so let's talk about RCWs here. Um, this is uh, some, these are some photos of uh, RCW cavities um, on let's Sandy remind, Island. Let's remind everybody what an RCW is again. Yeah, I'm sorry, RCW. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we get into the habit of using um, Quick mnemonics and uh, um, red cockaded woodpecker, uh, RCW. Um, so uh, these are small woodpeckers that uh, make their homes ex almost exclusively in longleaf pine forests. Um, and they require mature, if not old growth, longleaf pine in order to make their cavities. Um, they're the only woodpecker uh, that makes its cavity or its home in live trees. Um, most, if not all other woodpeckers, I should say all other woodpeckers make their cavities in dead trees. Um, red cockaded woodpeckers are non-migratory, so they're year-round residents, and so we have a, a population that occurs on Sandy Island. Um, and if I'm allowed to brag a little bit, this is the largest population of red cockaded woodpeckers that uh, the Nature Conservancy manages, um, which is pretty cool. Really cool. Um, so here, here's a picture. This is a picture of one of the cavity trees and it has this kind of white frosted look to it. Um, there's the cavity hole itself. Here's a, a close up view of the, of the cavity hole. And that hole is about the size of a golf ball, um, just to give you an idea of, of the size. Um, and Matt, I, uh, you know, you, you came up with this, this notion, this idea uh, about the, the cavity, um, this picture down here in the bottom of the bottom of the screen. Would you like to share a little bit about that? Sure, Tom. Uh, so I was up on the island a few weeks or a week before a field trip, and uh, we were checking roads, making sure no trees had fallen in the road. We had our chainsaw with us, uh, making sure there was air in the tires and just generally prepping for a visit to the island which you have to do. I mean, you, you, you need to understand that this, this, this place is remote and lots of things can happen in a, in a month on Sandy Island. Um, one of our old cavity trees had fallen over 
uh, right beside one of the roads and it, it wasn't in the road, but we could see it and we could see the frosted uh, look to the, to the bark. So we went over and, and looked at it. This was Patrick Ma and I, and we saw that it, um, that it was uh, indeed a cavity tree and we got the bright idea to cut out the section of the tree that, um, that would house the cavity which you can see in the bottom right corner of Tom's slide and bring it back to the TNC office and put some hinges on it. So it can be carried around and shown to, to people to, to better understand what the inside of a cavity looks like. Yeah, it's, it's a rare uh, occasion that you actually get to see inside of a woodpecker's home. So um, that's, it's, a, it's a bright idea and uh, we're happy to, to have that as kind of a showpiece now. Um, so here's a, a picture of, of the birds, um, obviously young, newly hatched birds with, with bands on their legs, and, as well as an adult here. Um, and um, like I said, these are, these are non-migratory um, uh, birds. Um, they're about the size of a, of a hairy woodpecker or a downy woodpecker for you birders out there. Um, and they're easily confused with, with those if, if you're um, if you're not familiar with some of the distinguishing features. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that should give you a, a good idea of, uh, of what the, the, little, um, the little birds look like. Um, and uh, right here, we, we, do some, we do extensive um, surveys of our population and, and the map here of, the, of Sandy Island on the left um, shows every dot on there is it represents a, a cavity tree on the island and every red kind of polygon that that collects several of those uh, those points um, is a cluster <clears throat> and um, this map a cluster of cavity trees and this map extends from 2015 um, our most intensive survey um, and our RCW population has, has really uh, taken off uh, um, since we first took ownership of the island or first protected the island. Um, we've increased the number of cavity trees uh, from 159 to 204. Um, from 1998, 159 active cavity trees to 204 in 2015. And we went from um, 36 clusters to 49 clusters in 2015. And, and both of those both of those increases are coincident with, with our prescribed firework. Mm -hmm. And um, I, we've, uh, we've invited Colette on here to, um, uh, to chat a little bit about uh, the woodpeckers and their, their interesting um, breeding habita uh, habits. And, and Colette, if you wanted to jump in here and share anything um, particular about the, the population of woodpeckers on Sandy Island. Sure. Yeah. Uh, glad to be here. Um, the, I, my first job actually after graduating undergrad uh, was spending three months on Sandy Island in 1998 to, to help ban the birds to get the baseline of RCWs. So, and then um, I helped TNC manage them after that for years. So it, it's, just, it's a lot of fond memories. I think that's me down there on my knees. I think so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, these birds are great, and the family dynamics are such that within each cluster, you can have anywhere from one, a single male bird, to upwards of maybe four um, birds at a time. But what's common is once a, a pair um, nest and lay their eggs, one male, it's called a helper male from their last um, clutch will actually hang around and be and help with the new clutch. So there's kind of interesting dynamics. So three birds is maybe most common, uh, but it can vary widely. And Sandy Island is just so unique, even with red cockaded woodpecker habitat. You know, we've got shorter trees out there because of the, the well drained soil. So things grow, you know, less vigorous. So it's easier to climb them compared to, say, the Francis Marion forest or other longleaf pine forests. And, and um, birds themselves, we feel like they can excavate cavities a lot quicker because those trees um, are a bit stunted and, and there's obviously very old trees out there as well. So even within the RCW dynamics on Sandy Island versus other longleaf pine forests in the, in the coastal plain in the southeast, um, I feel like there's a, just a unique niche uh, for red cockaded woodpeckers. 
Um, so they're, they have a unique sound. So oftentimes when you're walking around the woods or you get, get near one of their sappy um, uh, nest or roost trees, you can hear them chirping at you. Um, and those, that sap flows, um, it's thought to deter predators. You know, it's also thought maybe there's a visibility element to it. Um, so when, in, in the way RCWs forage, they're, they're scraping bark around the tree uh, looking for insects. So that helps those resin wells from longleaf pine flow. Uh, so it's a sticky business when you're climbing up those trees and, and either decking nests or, or uh, pulling out babies. Um, but overall, it's not, uh, you know, banding babies isn't as largely practiced now as it used to be. There's these unique things called peepers where you can stick a camera in there and you can kind of just see what's going on and then you, you monitor populations um, more from a distance with a scope. Uh, it's necessary in some instances when you need to get a baseline of RCWs or when you're um, trying to you know, check in with them periodically over time to see how you're doing. But the, they've definitely blossomed um, from reducing the shrub layer from <clears throat> uh, what was there previously from longleaf pine and uh, in those stands previously with the fire. So I can leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Colette, a whole bunch. Yeah. It's good to have you on here. Um, but the RCWs um, aren't, the, uh, aren't the only animals that, that we, uh, we encounter when we go out to Sandy Island. Um, we have swallowtail kites and, and um, you know, we, uh, we usually see quite a bit of swallowtail kites when uh, several swallowtail kites, when we burn on the island in the spring, say in, um, in April um, or uh, late March, they just come and flock to the, uh, the smoke column, um, which is pretty, pretty interesting behavior to watch. Um, plenty of snakes on the island, uh, bobcats, um, wild turkey, and deer, and, and here's one of, uh, Matt mentioned the songbirds that, that hang out um, in the, the marshes and the bottomland hardwoods around Sandy Island. This is a prothonotary warbler um, uh, hanging out uh, just on one of the creeks coming into the island. Um, and then we also have uh, this uh, one other uh, animal that, that likes to inhabit the island. And I'm gonna, we're gonna put up another poll question and see if you all can um, guess who, uh, who left these tracks. Um, so let's put it up there. All right, that's right. It's a, it's an Atlantic black bear. Um, and, uh, we, we do have, uh, um, resident bears on the island. Um, they, uh, they may come and go, but it seems like we've always got at least one hanging out on the island, and, and we see evidence of, of bear on the island um, pretty regularly. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting and, and extremely, um, uh, I, I just find it fascinating that we've got black bear on the island. Um, and Colette, I think we're going to call on you one more time here um, uh, to, to talk to us more about some, some particular unique plants on the island or, or some really cool plants on the island. Yeah, no, this is a, another one of my favorite topics. The plants communities on Sandy Island are, um, are not as rich, meaning the highest number of species that you'd see in other longleaf pine forests, because longleaf pine can be the you know, super biodiverse, second most biodiverse community outside of the rainforest and have upwards of 40 species per square meter. Um, but that's not the case on Sandy Island, again, because of the, the real dry nature of the soils, but you have a real characteristic species. Um, and along, you know, when you're going to Sandy Island, you'll see coastal azalea, the photo on the left along the banks of the waterways. That top middle picture is Sandhill rosemary. And that's an indication of this community type taking a page from the center of South Carolina, the Sandhill, um, you know, inner, inner coastal plain, the Sandhills there, where, you, where similar to Peachtree Rock, another TNC preserve, you'll see some similar species. This is a really interesting, unique species 
that has a, a um, not common at all, uh, considered rare, and uh, has a seed bank that builds up. And while it's in a fire tolerant place, it's real dry. So if you touch fire to it, it'll burn right up and then it'll take a little bit for the seeds to come back. So we, we tend to not touch it with fire, but move around it. Um, bottom middle is uh, Litsia estivalis or uh, pond spice, uh, which is um, uh, another rare plant that's around isolated wetlands. Um, and one of my favorites, the bottom right is uh, lupin, sky blue lupin or lupin diffusus. And these uh, pop up around March and it's really a beautiful little burst of color where there are not many um, on Sandy Island. And of course, top right is a ghost plant. Um, it's a, you know, lax chlorophyll, really interesting little plant that can grow in shade and tends to pop up around Sandy Island. And there's a lot of uh, vaccinium or blueberry species and Galacea or huckleberry species on Sandy Island, which attract things like bears, uh, the black bears that move through the island and, and um, also kind of den in those Pocos and shrubby areas. So just a, a real interesting uh, niche of species um, that are characteristic of the sandy soils of longleaf there. And then of course, other um, species in the oak um, bluffs and the other wetlands uh, that, you know, we don't, don't have pictures here of, of as well. Yeah, it's too bad we can't uh, show them pictures of everything on Sandy Island. I, when we were, when Matt and I were working on this uh, 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 presentation, uh, I told Matt, I joked with Matt that we could do uh, like six series on Sandy Island alone, yeah. just diving yeah, into fine. various aspects of it. Yeah. And, and with that too, I, I think I'd like to, Kind of shift gears from from uh, talking about uh, um, our our management on the island um, as we kind of wind down the, the talk here. Thanks, Colette, a whole bunch. Thank you, Colette. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's 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 shift gears a little bit here as we eye the end of of, of our time with you. And and what I want to talk about is is our community engagement on Sandy Island. Um, there is a. a uh, community um, on Sandy Island uh, called Sandy Island Village, um, and the folks who who live out there are direct um, descendants of enslaved Africans that were brought here against their will, um, and they still there's a community of of 50 or so people that still reside on the the southern end of the island, um, and uh, they. Uh, um, they live uh, here on the island. They work off the island typically, um, and uh, uh, we uh, try. We engage with them um, regularly, um, talking about our management um, and things that we're doing on the island, in particular about our firework. Um, we uh, we work with the community leaders um, there to uh, to engage and talk about some of uh, what they might be interested in or what they might need from us. Um, and we engage, in turn, engage um, our partners. Um, this, this picture down here on the right is a representative of the South Carolina Forestry Commission that we asked to come and speak to the community a few years back. Um, and uh, this picture here uh, is uh, one of the things that uh, Furman Long, our longtime land steward out there, um, has done and, and still continues to do is use Nature Conservancy vehicles and, and our trailer out there. And uh, every other year, the residents on the island have a family reunion get together in August. And um, uh, Furman takes folks around on the trailer um, and gives them a tour of the island and, and uh, talks about the work that we're doing and the work that we've done and, and some of the history of the island. Um, and they, um, he takes them to some of the cemeteries on the island where their descendants, or their, excuse me, their ancestors are, are buried. Um, and so really unique situation uh, and opportunity that, that, um, that arose a few years ago. Um, there were some of the two cemeteries, actually three cemeteries that we, we worked with um, the, uh, the residents of the island uh, to identify and, and clean up. Um, and and uh, some of these, uh, two of 
two of these cemeteries, uh, well, let's start out, let me back up. One of the cemeteries, a smaller one, um, is right inside the, the village. Um, there is another cemetery that's associated with the church that's located on the island as well. And um, uh, the other two are kind of dispersed from the, the main areas where the, the village is. Um, and we worked with Coastal Carolina University um, and uh, we knew where these cemeteries were located, uh, but the graves aren't marked. So we brought Coastal Carolina University out and uh, they brought in some ground penetrating radar and they helped locate individual graves um, as well as the actual boundary of the cemeteries. Um, and you know, these cemeteries hold the remains of emancipated slaves and their descendants. Um, so the folks that reside on the island, these are their ancestors. Um, many of them, like I said, are unmarked. Um, it makes them difficult to locate. And the, all the graves do is, is appear as just a small depression in the ground. And Tom, one of the uh, other interesting things about the community is that and unique aspects of the community is that the, the only school boat in the state of South Carolina right. is operated for the Sandy Island community to, to get the children over to the mainland to go to school. That's correct. And one of those old school boats is now owned by Captain Romy Pyatt. And you'll see in the bottom right uh, corner of this slide a, a gravestone with the last name Pyatt. So uh, Romy runs a tour operation called Tours to Sandy Island and you can find it on the web. But we, we've worked with Romy and the community to conduct some tours of the southern end of the island the, the, in the community where we, see, we visit the church and we visit the volunteer fire station. Uh, we drive around the village. We um, see some of the cemeteries that, that we're showing here. And then we'll go have lunch. Uh, Romy's mother, Beulah, will, will cook lunch usually fried chicken um, or perlo, which is another low country delicacy, one of my favorites. But And then in the afternoon, we'll tour around the southern end of TNC's preserve. So that's been a great way to engage with the community as well. Yeah, and I, I'll just point out a couple of things with this picture right here. It's hard to make out, but I'll draw circles around it. This is the largest cemetery that that is on the island that we know of. And this is about, uh, it's about an acre in size and you can't make them out, but these are, I'm circling pink flags, pink pen flags. And each one of those pen flags represents a, an individual grave that unmarked grave that was, that was discovered in this ground penetrating radar effort. Um, and that's a line of graves that goes well out in the woods. Um, it's just, a, it's upwards of a thousand remains in that one particular cemetery. Um, interestingly enough, the other cemetery um, has the remains of the founder of Sandy Island Village, Philip Washington. Um, he's buried there. Um, and, and we worked to get Mr. Washington's headstone replaced and, and reset because it was broken. Um, and interestingly enough, it's in one of our areas that we burn. And we identified burning as a, a likely uh, reason to, you know, clean up, but we can use fire to more clean up um, the, the cemetery and the, and the surrounding areas. We've, we've also put up markers and, um, uh, and marked boundaries of the, uh, of the cemeteries as well. So it's a really cool story, um, really cool engagement work um, with the, the folks on the island and it was something we're really proud of. Um, and I, I'd be remiss if, if we did this talk and didn't talk about climate and climate change impacts and, um, you know, with rising sea levels, um, freshwater tides are, are slowly becoming more brackish and, and we have elevated salinity that's reaching up the rivers, the PD and, and uh, the Waccamaw rivers. And, and those, that salinity is going to lead to some drastic changes to, to the island's plant and communities and, and wildlife. And, you know, we're likely to witness these changes in some of our lifetime. Um, and you can see this is the Sandpit River. These are, this is a skeleton of, these are skeletons of cypress trees here, which obviously was once freshwater and, and now it's saltwater. 
Um, but while, while those islands, uh, while the islands plants and, and wildlife are, are going to change, it's, it's place in history here is, and the legacy of those folks who saved it is, is really here to stay. And it will be carried on for a long, long time. And finally, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here um, and invite y'all to come out and, and visit Sandy Island. Um, uh, as Matt pointed out, here's Wakawachi Landing, here's Sandy Island Landing. Both of those are public uh, landings that you can drop a boat into. Um, and you can land at these three locations, this one right here, this yellow diamond and the one way up north on the island. And there are trails um, that you can walk. and. Um, Please, uh, please come and experience Sandy Island. This, this last trail, or this trail here at the bottom, um, is a two-mile trail um, that's named the Larry Paul Trail. And, and regretfully, um, uh, Larry passed away on December 5th of last year, and he, he was a benefactor to TNC, and, and we sincerely appreciate his generosity. Um, you know, his, his love of Sandy Island and his, his broader conservation ethic. So... Significant contribution. Um, Larry uh, actually um, donated a house to the Nature Conservancy that, that he built and owned. And, and I'll show a picture of that as we wrap up here and go to Q&A. Um, but that house is, is really key in allowing us, as well as our partners and contractors, to go out and efficiently do the conservation work that, that Sandy Island demands and, and really requires. So um, we're thankful of Larry and, and other benefactors that have been a, have played a hand in, in our work on Sandy Island. So with that, I'll say thank you for joining us and, and happy to open it up to question, questions that you all may have. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. And uh, there's a nice picture of the Larry Paul house. Um, we, I'm going through Q&A now, and I noticed that there is a question about Perlo, which is the dish <laughs> that I mentioned. It's, uh, it is a... It's a, a rice dish and you can include, uh, you usually start with uh, your, a base of onions. You can start with garlic, but you, um, you cook sausage or chicken or ducks or whatever you have on hand and you make a, a rice dish and it's really delicious and very, um, very homey. Um, we addressed some of the questions we had about the different plants. I see that Colette answered those and even some of our, um, our attendees, uh, Charles Everett, um, very well um, educated on ecology. Uh, we have that's another thing I want to point out. There are a lot of people on this call that um, that know a lot about uh, the Low Country and ecology too. Um, we covered the uh, native azalea. All right, this is interesting. Is there are there any eastern diamondback rattlesnakes or eastern coral snakes seen on Sandy Island? I've never seen a coral snake. Coral snakes typically are living in the in the organic layer and soil, they don't you don't see those typically unless you're digging around. Um, Eastern diamondbacks, no, um, we're a little too far north and a little too isolated to have any eastern diamondbacks. But there are cane breaks on there. There are cane breaks or timber rattlers as they're known elsewhere. Yep, plenty of big cane breaks actually. Yeah, I think about cane breaks every time I drive down Long Lane because Furman told me a story once of getting out of his truck to move a log out of the road. And when he picked the log up, a, a cane break struck at his hand and he, he it, it sticks with me just hearing that story. Yeah. All right, this is a two-part question. And Colette, I'm going to flip this one to you. Um, how do you get the the baby chicks, the of the red cockaded woodpeckers, removed from the nest to band if the cavity is so small. Remember, it's the size of a golf ball. Mm -hmm. And then, does handling and banding chicks result in any mortality? Yeah, I can answer that. So there's a little tool that you use that's like, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's kind of like a little rubber hose it like a noose and you know when you so you put your hand over the hole and the babies instinctively think that the mother is back to feed them so they stick up their necks and they start chirping and you just lower it in and just slide it gently around their their neck but and you just pull them up they're so light you just pull them up real quick and then just put them in your hand and then you carry them down at the ladder well you put them in a little pouch typically um collect them out, put them in a pouch, take them down, collect measurements and band them and put them back. And I have not, when I, the years that I did it, um, I did, 
never saw any mortality, but you know, manipulating wildlife in general, you wonder, you know, uh, if it's probably best to reduce it. So I think it's uh, one of those things that RCW biologists tend to not do it unless it's warranted. And the peepers are a new technology mm -hmm. that you can just peek in there, count the number of chicks and that kind of thing um, going forward. All right, this is an interesting question. Uh, as some of you may know, there has been a introduction of red wolves in the Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge near Highway 17, just outside of Charleston. And there's a question, would the island be an appropriate area for the eventual introduction of red wolves? Well, I, well that's a tricky question. Um, it is. I, yeah, I, you know, it, it probably could, but we, I think we'd have to understand what impacts we would be um, bringing in by reintroducing the wolf um, before we did that. I, right now we have um, a pretty healthy population of coyotes that, you, that fill kind of the niche of what red wolves used to fill. So um, I think we just want to understand what the um, likely impacts would be for that. Okay. I think that's a pretty good answer. Um, do we need volunteers for controlled burns? <laughs> um, you know, I, that, uh, we have taken volunteers in the past and, and happy to entertain volunteers coming out. Um, it's a very random um, and, and uh, event. Like you don't usually know until about 24 hours in advance. Um, uh, you need to have some training and pass a physical fitness test. Um, that we administer, um, and uh, once you once you show up at a burn, particularly on burning on Sandy Island, you're basically committed for a full day, and that full day is usually about 12 hours. It's usually from early morning until well after dark. So um, we take volunteers with those caveats. <laughs> we we do have other volunteer opportunities from time to time. Um, and they 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 sometimes trash cleanups, uh, but sometimes stuffing envelopes in the office. If you're if you're more into that sort of thing, we do accept those types of volunteer opportunities. So do get in touch with us if you have an interest in that. Uh, this is a question from earlier in the chat, and then we're going to go back and, and catch up with the the, the recent questions. Um, what someone wanted to know what the Coastal Conservation League's role was in protecting Sandy Island, and I will preface this by saying that uh, very few projects the Nature Conservancy undergoes in South Carolina, um, almost none are, are done without partnership with other organizations. And the Coastal Conservation League was very involved in the protection of Sandy Island, um, more from an advocacy standpoint, um, but we certainly appreciate their role in protecting the property. And that would have certainly been uh, Dana Beach, mm -hmm. who is the founder of Coastal Conservation League and a, and a great conservationist here. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I wouldn't have anything else to add. I, I think they were instrumental, uh, particularly Dana uh, was instrumental in helping protect Sandy Island. All right, so we'll see if we can catch up. We got a few more minutes uh, to uh, to the call here. We will be sharing a recording of this call, just so everyone knows. We'll probably get that out in the next week or so. Um, can you get there without a boat? Uh, you could swim, swim. <laughs> you were adventurous, but you do have to get across a body of water, either the uh, coming over from the Plantersville section of Georgetown County, which would be more difficult and to navigate through that massive wetland system, but it can be done. Um, and you can come, the easiest way would be to come over from Wakawachi and enter Box Creek and access the island on our public dock there in Box Creek. But you do have to sort of, you need, I would recommend you making, I mean, it's good to have Verizon because they have the best cell service I find. And I can get all over that island and I can see where I'm at on, right. on, on Google Maps through Verizon service. Um, but yeah, you do need a boat or swim. <laughs> We, it looks like someone, uh, Kara, our marketing director, put a link in for the maps. Can you kayak right. to the island? Absolutely. Um, if you do go to the northern end of the island uh, through Bull Creek and access that launch or that landing point, that's about a two and a half hour to three hour paddle both each way. 
So again, that's a full day of kayaking, just, just to give you an FYI. So if you do a shorter trip, go through Box Creek. <laughs> what are your feelings towards the continuous housing development throughout Ori and Georgetown counties? Well, the Nature Conservancy, I'll take this one, and Tom, Colette, jump in if, you, if you'd like to add anything. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is, uh, is interested in seeing our developers and our community leaders and county state government promote responsible development. Um, development is going to happen in, in any growing economy or stable economy, but we want to make sure that it's done in a responsible way that doesn't impact wildlife and important ecosystems, but also doesn't impact current residents. I mean, we a lot of our development, irresponsible development results in people uh, getting flooding in their yards or in their homes when that didn't occur uh, 30, 40 years ago. We of course will look to uh, work on projects that uh, protect critical places, critical ecosystems. And, and we, we also are very careful with the types of projects we work on because we wanna make sure they do have a big impact in terms of conservation. All right, we have a question about um, someone who has finished their undergrad in environmental science. Congratulations. And uh, I have a passion for conservation. How do I get started in helping with Sandy Island? Um, well, someone asked about volunteering. Um, I think that's a tremendous uh, uh, route to take. Um, uh, you could, there are, there's a friends group. Um, that's associated with the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge that, that um, you can engage that way. Um, I'll put a plug in here for our fire crew. We hire eight people um, every year beginning, um, we do our hiring work in October um, for work starting in January. And we hire eight seasonal staff that work January through April or May uh, of every year doing control burns, um, as well as uh, um, other stewardship work around the state. It's not just on Sandy Island, but it's across the entire state. We go up and help out in the, in the mountains as well. And, and that's, a, that's a good place to, to start as well. Thank you, Tom. Um, how uh, are there any large live oak species on the island? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly live oak, we have water oak. Live oak, water oak, turkey oak. Post oak, um, we have lots of different species of oaks and, and the highest concentration of the, the live oaks are on the south end of the island. Uh, how often do you have tours of the island? Well, pre-COVID, uh, <laughs> we, would, we would about once a year organize a, a group to the northern end of the island. Um, in terms of working with the community, I mentioned some of those tours we would do in conjunction with Captain Romy Pyatt. Um, those happen two or three times, typically in the spring, maybe one in the fall. And that was oftentimes when a, a community reached out to me about specifically visiting the, the village or the, the community there. So uh, reach out to us if you, if you do have an interest. Um, I, I don't know what, we, no one knows what the future looks like in terms of the pandemic, but um, we hope to be seeing people face to face before the end of the year. Yeah. I think we got time for one more, Matt. All right. I hope it's a good one here. <laughs> and just just to let everybody know too, we'll um, we'll collect the questions that you all put in the uh, in the chat, and um, and we'll try to reach back out to you all and answer your questions. Um, let's see here. Do the bears swim over? Yes, they do. Indeed, they do. Yep. Next field trip, all right. Can you spend the night there? That's a good question. Um, there is actually a bed and breakfast on the southern end of the island. It's called Wilma's Cottage. You can find that online if you, if you uh, would like to, to search for that. Do the children typically leave the island as adults? Um, Yes, a lot, of the, a lot of the children that grow up in the Sandy Island community end up leaving the island. And um, they are, of course, the community is interested in their adults or their young adults coming back and keeping the community alive. 
And that's something that's important to us as well. And, and one of the reasons why we want to continue working with the community and, and, and doing what we can to work with, with uh, Romy and, and his family. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you do go to Sandy Island by boat, one of the things you can do is, is visit the Sandy Island store, which is right on the banks of the Waccamaw River, and it's run by Beulah Pyatt, Romy's mother. She's one that I mentioned that, that cooks lunch whenever we tour the village. And there are uh, some interesting and in, uh, publications that she keeps in her, her shop that talk about the Gullah Geechee um, culture there on the island and a lot about the history of the island. And of course, you can buy, a, you know, soft drinks and, and uh, snacks as well. She does not serve lunch. If, if you're looking to go on the island and have lunch, that's not like a, um, a, a service they provide. We, we organize that in advance. All right. Well, I think we need to wrap this up. I think we could probably go on and on and on uh, with questions. Yeah, like, I, like I said, we could, we could also do we, <laughs> we could easily do a series on just Sandy Island in particular. There's so many different facets to that that place. Yeah. So. Well, so many of you uh, joined the call today. I think this might be a, a new record for South Carolina webinars, and we're so thankful for your participation today, so thankful for your support for the Nature Conservancy and our work here in South Carolina. We could not do it without your help, um, so um, we're excited about the work we do. Uh, we just wrapped up a, a five-year campaign, and we're now launching a five-year strategic plan which really focuses our work to make sure we get the maximum impact. So thank you again for your support and your interest in our work. Tom, Paulette, thank you so much for your time and your, your presentation today. Uh, thank you, it was a pleasure.